Good evening. Welcome to another edition of uh, Public Affairs, Public Access. I'm your guest host, uh, David Hutzelman, and I'm uh, here to talk about uh, some things that are pertinent to the city of Houston's future. I usually have on my show uh, things that we talk about from a libertarian perspective, and I'm often asked, what is a libertarian's perspective anyway? And I say, well, it's basically a bunch of people that are interested in a lot less government than we have today, uh, and not the crony capitalism, but a free market uh, in economics, uh, a pretty uh, tolerant society where we don't have the government spying on us and uh, trying to buy, uh, regulate our private behavior, and a pretty much non-interventionist policy in foreign, in foreign relations. But uh, today we're going to be closer to home and... Uh, and talking about the mayoral race coming up uh, this fall, and we're very pleased to have uh, one of the mayoral candidates, one of the three, I guess. Uh, are there more than three, Tony? There are more. Uh, there are more, but, well, anyway, the three major. T <laughs> Tony Busby is here to talk to us uh, with us tonight, and my friend Charles uh, Blaine is here to help with the interviews. Charles is a recently uh, founder and uh, Director yeah. of uh, Urban Reform, right. uh, which uh, you can get to on urbanreform.org Org. and <laughs> keep up with what Charles is doing with a lot of good work on keeping tabs on City Hall and trying to increase the uh, transparency that we as taxpayers have a right to, uh, to see. But tonight we're going to switch to uh, whatever the hot topics are in the mayoral's race, and obviously we got a few months to go before that race actually happens, but things are popping around the city. <laughs> Tony is uh, is causing things to be uh, kind of stirred up a little bit. And I guess the first thing we have to do is the firefighters, uh, judges ruling on uh, making Prop B uh, uh, unconstitutional or according to the Texas Constitution. Is that what, maybe you can explain to us what the ruling is, Charles. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, thanks again for having me. I, I always appreciate coming back. I feel like I'm a friend of the show now. I come back pretty regularly. So thanks for having me. Um, but yeah, so we've kind of had this long drawn out firefighter fight for probably a year and a half, if not more now, um, arguing over uh, pay parity uh, with the police and trying to, uh, you know, convince the administration to implement it. Then the, you know, HPOU sued, argue after the vote, arguing that it was unconstitutional and it violated collective bargaining. And there's kind of been all this back and forth. So recently, well, yesterday, um, during city council, uh, uh, city attorney Ron Lewis got up. He usually sits at his seat there uh, during the entire council meeting. Got up, brings his phone over to Turner, and, and Turner then begins to read the ruling from the phone that says that uh, the judge, Judge Garrison, has ruled uh, that Prop B is unconstitutional and violates Texas local government code. Um, so it, you know, kind of stunned people. I think this is the first time for me watching city council that Turner actually interrupt, Mayor Turner actually interrupted uh, city council to, you know, read a proclamation or read something like that. So it's really interesting. But yeah, they, uh, the judge has ruled it unconstitutional. Immediately the firefighters said they were going to appeal. Um, they filed a notice of appeal last night or, or yesterday afternoon, if I'm not mistaken. And so that's where we are now. Turner said he's moving forward with implementing his version of of raises, um, what he has offered the firefighters in the past, and the firefighters are obviously still going after pay parity. So, you know, it seems like it's a, a long, drawn-out fight that's never going to end, but um, I guess it's, yeah, what, so what's your take on it? I mean, this well, is, you know, you've been very vocal about this. So. Yeah, I mean, you, we, let's re not remember, or not forget that we had pay parity uh, back when Lee Brown was the mayor. So this is something that if we had a competent mayor, we, mm -hmm. could, we could make happen. Uh, and this has been a long, drawn-out fight. And I was at Station 31 today, and, um, you know, the men and women there are still motivated. Uh, if you ask them, they will tell you that, that this ruling is just a blip on the radar screen, that for them, uh, their number one goal is to make sure Mayor Turner is no longer the mayor <laughs> uh, after November 5, uh, or certainly, you know, January. Right. Um, so what we have here is we have a, a, the same court with two different judges in that court. One ruled it to be constitutional, one ruled it to be unconstitutional. Uh, the argument, of course, is that well, you can't tie firefighter pay to, to police officer pay. You have to tie firefighter pay to uh, a similar uh, job in the civilian world. But Isn't that pretty hard to find? I don't think similar it job. I don't a, think it exists. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> but, but but the bigger picture is when you look at look at the firefighters and how they're paid, um, 
and you compare them to Austin, Dallas, uh, other major cities in, in uh, the state of Texas, they're paid well below their peers in other cities. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you know, whose fault is that? Well, of course the mayor will say, well, that's previous administrations. That's, you know, the firefighters unwillingness to, to bargain. I would say it's previous mayors unwillingness to bargain with these folks. And I think it's pretty clear uh, from the voters will, because we can't forget that 298,000 people voted for pay parity. So if I were the mayor, lay aside the legal uh, uh, maneuvers, you know, using his former law firm uh, to find, uh, you know, uh, this to be so-called unconstitutional. That will ultimately play itself out over the next 18 months, and, and I have no doubt it will go to the Texas Supreme Court, and we'll have a, we'll know one way or the other uh, whether that particular uh, charter amendment was in fact constitutional. Uh, but let's not forget, 298,000 people voted to give these firefighters a raise. And if you're the mayor, uh, and that's almost 200,000 more people than voted for him, he better give these firefighters the raise. I mean, we need to make sure that our firefighters have, have good uh, morale. We need to make sure they have the right equipment. Uh, when you were talking about a little bit about libertarian uh, points of view, uh, I think we all can agree, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green, whatever, whatever you claim you are, uh, are, are nothing like me, uh, that um, co the core services are what we should be focused on, and that is police and fire. And of course, within our fire is our EMS, because um, that's where we should focus. So for this whole idea of implementation uh, back before Prop B was declared unconstitutional of laying off firefighters, uh, that was in vendetta by this mayor, uh, and I'm, I'm sure he's feeling uh, pretty good about himself now, uh, you know, his unwillingness to negotiate and getting a judge to declare this unconstitutional. But I bet you, and I, and I, would, I would venture to guess that, that uh, he may have won this small battle, but I think this will seal his fate because I, I could see in the eyes of those men and women uh, at the fire station, they brought over three other fire stations to meet with me and we talked about these very things we're talking about and they are resolved. Mm -hmm. uh, they're gonna do whatever it takes to make sure that Sylvester Turner is not the mayor uh, come January. Well, I find a couple things inter really interesting about this. The first being that I think it really shows elections matter, right? So like you said, the previous judge who was ousted in the November elections and then replaced <clears throat> by the current judge in January when she was sworn into office, ruled that it was constitutional. So now, you know, we had a complete sweep of the judiciary and now it's a complete reversal. So I think that's the first thing is that, that you know, elections matter and I think that, that can, you know, apply to so many different areas. But another thing is, uh, you also mentioned how they are underpaid when compared to, you know, uh, uh, colleagues in other cities. I saw recent posts from, um, I think it was the Dallas Fire Department offering $60,000 starting salary if they come over. And, and if you think about that, I mean, you know, it's frustrating because we train them, we pay for that, they go through the academy, then if they go and leave, which I can't blame them because, you know, you want to put food on the table, you want to make a decent salary for the work that you're doing, um, that, that's a loss on the city. So it's kind of ridiculous to continue this fight when we're losing money in the long run because we're allowing them to leave. And I think the, the other thing that's really interesting about this is, is the city is really hinging on this unconstitutional thing, whereas they've been, in numerous instances, uh, things that the city has done has been ruled unconstitutional, ballot propositions and things like that. I mean, even the rain tax in recent history, and they can continued to collect it after it was ruled unconstitutional. So to argue that now because it's ruled unconstitutional, we need to change what we're doing or what we were going to implement, it's, it's kind of frustrating um, because they don't do it when it's when it benefits their side. So. Yeah, we could go back <clears throat> in some ancient history uh, to uh, a Prop B that wasn't this Prop B, but the Prop B from 10 years ago, yeah. right. which uh, Turner is still living under and is still active in the court system to put a revenue cap on uh, the city of Houston. And I'm not sure exactly where that uh, stands right now, but, but one thing that it, it uh, occurs to me that the firefighters were certainly a potent force for putting a ballot initiative on mm. the ballot. And I'm wondering, you have some thoughts about uh, your pay for play mm -hmm. uh, uh, ballot proposition. Are the firefighters a good source of uh, getting those signatures for you also? Yeah, but let's but recall that uh, you can only uh, amend your charter once, once every, every two, two years. years. True. So, so anybody that suggests that you can that we can do another Prop A, Prop B, whatnot, so, you know, collect forty thousand signatures and get something on the ballot, you can't do that until, for until that two years because even though Prop B is now unconstitutional, there was a Prop A, right. which was put in place as we know to fix 
this long. They don't out. like that either yeah. now either now yeah. that they put it in place. Uh, so probably the best way to make the uh, the changes that I think the city has to make, that is, uh, if you give money to a council person, the controller, or the mayor candidate, um, a may, any mayor candidate, and I'm putting everybody on notice now, whether I don't care who the mayor candidate is, if you've given money to that mayor candidate, win or lose, uh, you're going to be precluded from doing business with the city for a year. And, uh, and uh, that's what I want to do, and I want to do that by How ordinance. does that do? You can do that with do uh, that by mayoral, uh, yeah. executive, whatever? Well, not, I, I can't, I don't, you know, I'm not, I can't do an executive order, but okay. I, can, <laughs> I can certainly shame the city council to vote for it. Oh, okay. okay I can shame the city council. Yeah. But we need a, the city needs a complete, uh, somebody, one of my former Marines made a comment about me at one of these events, um, and he said, you know, Tony's not just going to stir things up, he's going to turn, turn the pot over. And that's what I'm going to do. Every single position, whether it be the, the uh, you know, Sports Authority, the Greater Houston <clears throat> Partnership, Houston First, all these folks that have been running this city for so long and, in my view, running it into the ground, uh, who are big supporters of this mayor, we're going to have a whole sweeping change of leadership that's focused on make the government work, pick the trash up on time, you know, more police officers on the street, give the firefighters the support that they deserve, balance the budget, and if there's money left over, then yeah, maybe we will, we will buy art for City Hall, but I doubt it. <laughs> How about bands for the airport? <laughs> yeah, you, you really want to get me started? <laughs> I mean, holiday lights, bands for the airport, poet laureate, you know, y'all know I, I'm, a, I, I, I'm a, an amateur poet. I love music, bands at the airport, $3 million over three years. Uh, beautification of City Hall, 4.9 million. A million nine of that is is city money. Yeah. Now we're told that they're going to spend 15 million on further beautification of City Hall and art. Uh, we hear about this film consultant that gets paid 155,000 a year and a $4,000 a month condo that lives in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. the, this is what we're spending our money on. While at the same time our streets are crumbling, sidewalks are crumbling. There's trash all over this city. We have an epidemic homeless problem. We have stray animals that are running on the east end. They're chasing children on the, on, in the third ward. Uh, you, you have animals that are, stray animals that are digging under or jumping over people's fences and killing their pets. Uh, we may have somewhere, and it's hard to know, between 100,000 to 3 million stray animals in the city of Houston and the Houston area. Uh, we got a lot of major quality of life issues and, and, and I always say it like this, and I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but, but you know, you don't, you don't buy art when, you're, when your um, foundation's crumbling. <laughs> and that's what's going on in the city of Houston. Now, am I, I don't want to be uh, Debbie Downer and say, oh my gosh, you know, the sky is falling, but, but the sky is falling. Yeah. <laughs> and we need to get back to, to be providing the service that the, sit, the residents pay for. And uh, we can do that. I mean, we have, I, I've been so impressed and, and gratified by the amount of people who are good-hearted, sincere, who really want to make a difference. I met with a, a gentleman today. He's like, Tony, I work for a dollar. I don't want anything. I don't want to do anything. I don't want any business from the city, but I can fix your permitting department. I can fix it. I can show you exactly how to fix it, how to make it work, how to generate more revenue for the city, but also give the people that want to develop some certainty uh, and and quick quick either approval or, or non-approval, but th so they're not being held in limbo. There's sometimes that it takes uh, more time to get a permit to build something than it takes to actually build it. Uh, that can't work. Um, you know, this mayor and other mayors have said we're going to put more police officers on the street. Well, the truth is we have fewer police officers on the street. We have 52, right under 5,200 uh, police officers. Uh, in the Houston Police Department, less than 2,300 actually patrol. The truth were known. Uh, we actually don't really patrol anymore. You know, the whole purpose of patrol is de deterrence and stop crimes before they occur. And I know that's one of the topics we're going to talk about. But we're not serious about it. We, we talk about we're going to fill potholes. We're not serious about it because we don't fill potholes. Uh, we talk about we're going to deal with flooding. Well, we're not really serious about it because are we in any better shape now? than we were when the mayor took office, than we were before Harvey? No. I, I would suggest in some places in the city, we're worse off. Certainly in Kingwood, they are worse off. Mm -hmm. If there's another flood or another uh, Harvey rain incident like occurred with the silt that's in that in the San Jack River and that mouth bar that they have over there, uh, they're going to get devastated once again. So 
we need somebody that's like, you know, I don't, I'm not coming in here to, to grease my, my law partner's pockets. I'm not coming in here to make somebody happy. I, this person gave me money. I can make sure he has a seat at the table or she has a seat. I'm not into that foolishness. You know, I'm not taking campaign donations. Uh, I'm not out actively seeking endorsements. You know, my team has kept pressing me like, Tony, you need to fill out these these informational things and you need to go meet them. I'm doing that, but I'm checking the box that says I'm not seeking your endorsement. But I'll certainly sit with you, hear your concerns, so I can be a better mayor. Yeah. And uh, whether it be Third Ward, Fifth Ward, whether it be Uptown, Upper Kirby, East End, you know, I want to hear everything uh, about what people's concerns are because that's going to make me a better mayor. Yeah. You touched on the permitting center, which I think is really interesting, and it's, it's kind of often glossed over. I don't think people spend a lot of time talking about permitting, but it is a huge issue. I mean, you know, when you when you have a city that bottle bottles up permits and people can't get permits, you end up, you know, delaying development, supply never meets demand, housing costs go up, rent goes up, all these different things happen, and, and it seriously, significantly impacts a lot of people, especially lower income people. The same people who our mayor always talks about, you know, affordability and, and increasing housing stock and things. So it's kind of, you know, complete opposite to what we actually see. But one thing um, that I do think is that, you know, people who are uh, favored by the administration probably don't see those same permitting delays and things like that. So that kind of brings me back to your to your pay to play um to the pay-to-play conversation um, with Houston having such a strong mayor and having, you know, probably I'd argue one of the strongest mayors in the country, because even if you look at New York or L.A., they can their council members can submit things and, and have, you know, things voted on. But we can't. So how do you see I, I you explained how you want to change it, but how do you see that kind of shifting the conversation at City Hall when that is implemented? Do you I mean, is, is this kind of what a lot of the issues that we see at City Hall hinge on the fact that people who are contributing get kind of immediate access to to lawmaker, lawmakers, if you will. Yeah, I think so. I don't think you can you can make a credible case that you're going to fix the streets, uh, actually do something about drainage, uh, actually hire more police and actually have them actually patrol in these areas that need deterrence and patrol uh, if you can't make the credible case that you're going to clean up City Hall first. Because that, in my view, that's where it starts. Because and you've heard about the, the, uh, the, the way they do minority subcontracting. Uh, it's a farce. Uh, it's the same people yeah. over and over. And, and you filed a lawsuit about yeah. the NWB contract. Should you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, what we found out was I was just uh, meeting uh, with a group of folks that are trying to bring in uh, Heisman Trophy winners. They want to do a Heisman Trophy weekend. They want to bring in and try to get other local uh, former football players involved like Vince Young and uh, Johnny Manziel. And they want to have like a have a, a situation where the Heisman Trophy winner can talk about his, his life and how he, he became successful in a father-son lunch. It was a really good thing. And I was like, man, I'll try to help you raise some money to support that. Completely non-campaign related. Mm -hmm. But one of the individuals that was in that meeting said, Tony, I want to ask you something kind of separately unrelated to this. He said, I'm a, I'm a city contractor, or at least a certified uh, minority business owner. My wife, uh, she, she's actually 51% owner, so it's a woman-owned business and a minority-owned business. And he said, I got certified in 2013. I've never gotten a city contract. And I was, uh, I got an email that said I may qualify for one of these contracts. And I was trying to put together some information to make a bid. And lo and behold, when I got on the city's website, I had already gotten a bid. And I was like, well, I had to explain. He said, I actually had gotten parts of two contracts, two $66 million contracts. One, I got $4 million, And the other one, I got a million six, so more than $5 million. I said, are those big contracts for you? He says, man, those are life-changing contracts for me. I said, so what, what, what's the problem? He said, I, don't, I didn't submit for these. I didn't know anything about these. I don't know who the prime contractor is. I don't know what the scope of work is. I have no agreement with the prime contractor. I've, this is somebody just used my name and certification to, to get two different $66 million contracts. And these are these, these uh, monies uh, for Harvey Hurricane Relief that are coming from D.C. through the General Land Office. And uh, I said, well, let me, I said, I don't know. I said, first thing, let's see, you want the business, right? He said, yeah, I want the business. So I called the CEOs of both of these companies. I said, I'm just calling, you know, as a friend, but what, how is it that this man and his, his wife and this business got these contracts? They're listed. Clearly, you put them in, their pack, in the package and, that you submitted to the city under penalty of perjury. Mm -hmm. How is it they got these contracts? Oh, we just put people, here's what he told me. We just put people's names in there. And then later, once it's fun, the contract is funded, then we decide who we're actually going to use. And I and I was like, I don't 
I, pal, I don't really think that's how it works. <laughs> so then we did, we did a little research, and what we found that every sub that's listed that we were able to contact, not one knew that they had a, supposedly had a subcontract with wow. this, these prime contractors. That's how the city is working now. That's why we filed a lawsuit. And, you know, my point um, to uh, this man and his wife was, well, you know, maybe let's not blow this up. Let's see if you can get the business because ultimately you want the business. Right. He said, you know, Tony, I don't trust these. I don't have a contract with these guys. I don't trust these people. Uh, and so what we're doing now is trying to do a thorough analysis to look back at other contracts to see how many times subs have been used without their knowledge to get these big city contracts. And remember, we're talking about $1.18 billion worth of federal monies that is that we're finally going to receive. Remember, there's not been any rebuild so far right. from Harvey uh, that we're finally going to receive, and this is how the city operates. This city is broken. Uh, the way that it work that it operates just doesn't work. Okay. Well, that certainly is a ringing indictment <laughs> of what's going on in City Hall. Crazy. Yeah, my worst fears come to uh, attempt to lift. Um, Changing subjects uh, a little bit. Um, I know there's a big uh, expenditure coming up on the census uh, issues. Yeah, we're spending a bunch of money to try to get more federal made mm -hmm. to funnel through the mayor's office, I guess, to people that don't even know mm -hmm. they're on the yeah. on the list to get it. I'm wondering uh, what do we uh, what can we turn up about this uh, central center? I understand there's like 600. 600,000, 600 million, what was that? Yeah, 650,000 that they were. It, That's the first start, and then yeah, there's 900,000 yeah. later on. That's yeah. a one and a half million dollars. Well, and, it's, and it's interesting, because you know, with, with that, they make a good argument in the sense that if for every additional person that they count in the census, they say they bring in about $1,500. So if they, I forgot what the specific number of, of uh, additional counts that they <clears throat> get would kind of pay for itself. That's if they get those counts. But yeah, it, it, you know, I think within that, there are a number of interesting directions to go. But one of the issues that Mike Knox, uh, Council Member Mike Knox brought up was that um, some of the subcontractors within that were not really uh, designed for just kind of generic outreach. These were kind of activists who had an agenda that they wanted to pursue. I mean, they have been involved with, you know, uh, I, I guess left-leaning, you know, movements before, and it seemed as though this is what they were trying to do, is use, you know, public funds to kind of, um, I don't want to say, you know, pursue activism, but try to kind of push a narrative that they wanted to see. So, you know, my accounts member Mike Knox and a few others kind of really blew that up and talked about it a bit. But it is really interesting because, you know, the mayor kept arguing that uh, council member Mike Knox said that if we vote for phase one, we're likely going to vote for phase two. Why would you spend six hundred and fifty thousand right. dollars and then not complete the project? And the first half of it was specifically supposed to be used for kind of preparation for the outreach. So uh, what the mayor's argument was, was that this is just the first agenda item and you'll have a chance to revisit it later. But I mean, it seems kind of nonsensical because I think, you know, Knox was right. It's if you're voting on the first one, you're going to vote on the second. One, otherwise, you're, you're just spending six hundred fifty thousand dollars for no reason. But I do think it draws a, a bigger problem there. It's a lot like I mean, it goes back to the subcontractor issue. A lot of these subcontractors either are unverified. They don't know they're on there. Some of them are, you know, kind of directly activist driven who may be associated with the mayor or other groups. What, what is their presumed job description for these people that are going to get the job, the, the job description was to, uh, I believe it was, it was very vague, but it said something along the lines of, you know, uh, ensure that hard to count populations were counted in the census. Oh, so we're talking about people who don't want to be counted traditionally because of one reason or another. They don't want to interact with federal government. They don't want to respond to census counts, whatever the case may be. Um, and then the mayor's argument, I remember him saying, he's like, well, this can't be politically driven because we're going to be counting everyone, including babies, and babies don't have a political affiliation. <laughs> um, so it's like kind of ridiculous. But I do think it's a bigger point. I mean, it, it kind of goes back to this, this uh, subcontractor problem that we have where there seems to be little oversight and there seems to be a lot of uh, corruption, if you will, within that process and, and no one until now has been calling it out. There, and there's no oversight. Mm. I mean, that's the problem. There's literally none. And, and even when the mayor was asked at one of the press conferences about, about the lawsuit and about how is it that a minority subcontractor could be included uh, in a Prime's contract submission and not know it and not have a letter of intent or a, a subcontract in place. His, his response was, well, 
the money hasn't actually been paid yet, so no fraud could have been, could have occurred yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, and let's talk Reassuring. about the census. You know, I, I believe, uh, I believe, and I may be wrong, that um, once the, the census is completed, and I used to be an enumerator myself when I was in college. One of What's my, an enumerator? Somebody that goes house to house and has the counts. Yeah, and sometimes you know people pull weapons on you. you know, what are you doing here? I'm from the federal government. I'm here to help, to help yeah. you. <laughs> but, uh, yes. But uh, yeah, I, I worked on the census, and um, you know, but I, I believe that that Houston, we will find ourselves as the third largest city in the country. I believe that. I hope so, yeah. uh, because I think I think. Who we, are we passing? Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. Uh, as long as everyone's counted. So I I, I think we start with the, the proposition that we want everybody to be counted. Mm. Now that's a completely separate matter from the way the city does contracts and subcontracts. <laughs> I mean I, I can I can give you many examples, but the probably the, the most pertinent one is is you know we. we uh, after Hurricane Harvey, uh, somebody thought it would be a good idea to do community outreach to find those people who would qualify for federal aid. Now, of course, nobody's got any federal aid yet, but mm. to find those people. So they, they find a company out of Virginia that's run out of Louisiana for, for, for fraudulent mm. conduct. And for being corrupt. Now that's that you got to, No, you get run out of Louisiana for being corrupt. Well, you says a lot. You, you are the uh, pretty low bar. Yeah, right? one of the one of the state senators said like they were the creme de la creme of corruption. <laughs> so you know, you know, I, I'm just going to have to follow. You know, agree with that. But but then they come to Houston. They partner up with with Sylvester Turner's former law partner, who he worked with for 20 years, and piece him off. So they have seven principals, and now they have eight because Sylvester Turner's law partner is now one of their owners. And uh, each of them gives ten thousand or five thousand dollars to Sylvester Turner's reelection effort, and then some of their spouses give, and some of their children give to Sylvester Turner. And lo and behold, they get a thirty-five million dollar contract. Part of which is six point seven goes separately, not just but separately to Turner's law partner um, for his legal work, for his his great legal acumen. That uh, you know that's why everybody knows his name. Nobody knows his name. Um, <clears throat> anyway. That's how contracts are done in the city of Houston. And so if that's how things are being done, basically it's not about the, the merit that you have, the service you provide, uh, you know, how effective you're gonna be and finding people that we wanna make sure we count, but it's more about who do you know, which, you know, which person have you given money to. That's how, the city, that's how our city works right now and that's why I have no faith in, in any entity or outfit that this mayor pushes to work on the census. Yeah. So, so to that point, you know, about effectiveness, you know, uh, compared to just kind of who you know and, and how you got there, um, you've said a few times during this campaign that you would like to see an independent auditor um, in the city. And so I'd like to get some more clarification on that because my when you say that, my mind immediately goes to either, you know, the Office of Inspector General or the controller. So what do you mean by that and, and kind of where do you see that fitting within our local government and just kind of, you I'll know, tell you, I'll tell you a process that I, th I thought was extremely effective uh, when I was serving as a, a board member of the Board of Regents of Texas A&M University System. We had 11 universities and seven state agencies. And I was the, um, the head of the audit committee, which meant that rather than the chief auditor reporting to the chancellor, she reported directly to me. Which me, and I remember sitting uh, with about 500 people in the audience with all the presidents of the various universities and the directors of the various state agencies and saying, are you telling me I can audit anything? <laughs> and you could see the fear in their eyes. Like, I'm, we're, gonna get, we're getting ready to, you know, to take a real hard look here. Uh, but it's, but Typically, when somebody hears this word audit, they're thinking, you know, financial audits. And I'm talking more about process audits. Mm -hmm. I'm talking more about how does the process work, uh, whether it be IT. How do, we, how do we protect our data or make sure our people's data is not, not being compromised? How do we pick up trash? Mm -hmm. How do we do policing? How do we do our fire? You know, I'm talking about bringing in people with no skin in the game other than that they have a sincere desire to make Houston work and have them say, oh, look, I'm giving you carte blanche. I want you to go look at the way we police. And let me, let me tell you my mindset on this. Policing, we should be more anticipatory. We should be more in deterrence. We should be more in the communities. We should have police officers that live in the areas in which they patrol, those kind of things. But this is what I want you to look and I want you to give me a report of how we can do policing better, how we can save money. The permit department, same, same concept. Planning, planning and zoning, the same concept. Uh, tell, let's do a process audit of Metro. Tell me not, somebody that Metro chose, mm. but somebody that I chose, because my goal is to make sure that we're spending the money correctly, that the government is working for us. How do we pick up trash? Uh, are we really recycling? There's so many questions 
you know, and and also with regard to help me put into place real campaign finance reform in the city of Houston with teeth, with teeth, you know, that we know for, for a fact that one of the major lobbyists in the city, as an example, and I won't mention her name yet, but I'm eventually going to. Um, <laughs> you don't <laughs> just stay tuned. Uh, you know, worked as a lobbyist for years without ever registering as a lobbyist. Never, never submitted reports about what she was spending, where she was going, who, which council member she was taking to the Rockets games. I would see her at the Rockets games. I would see her with certain council members, and I would see her at Steak Forty Eight. I would see her at Mastro's here in town, some of the more expensive restaurants in town, with the mayor. And I even went up and asked him one time, who paid for your dinner tonight, Mayor? That's a pretty expensive restaurant. And, and I went to look at the reports, and there was no report filed. So when I talk about audits, it's not just financial audits, because you can, I mean, any business owner knows you can always pay for an audit that you want. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a true process audit to make sure that we have the more people at the table, the better. People from all different kinds of stakeholders to look at the way we do our work to make sure that we can serve the citizens and residents of the city in a better way mm -hmm. and to make it public. And, you know, sometimes we have to be honest with ourselves and we can't, you know, I know that we didn't, that, you know, the mayor worked very, very hard to get the DNC here, uh, the DNC convention. And one of the things he did, you may recall, is they had a big press conference about how uh, the crime rate was dramatically decreasing. That was part of his effort to get the DNC here. That was one of the issues that the DNC had. Well, he was just blowing smoke, right? Because we see, and the same when they tell us that homelessness has, has, has decreased by half, or when he tells us he's filled 10,000 potholes. Well, guess what? I drive around the city. I know what the streets are like, you know? So the first step is let's be honest. And part of that is to get new, new eyes, fresh faces into the mix and say, look, I've been doing... You know, I've been building houses for 15 years. Let me tell you how the permitting process has hurt me. Or I've been building and operating restaurants and just, uh, you know, I, I live on this area of town. Let me tell you, I live in the third ward. Illegal dumping is just rampant, fifth ward, rampant. And let's figure out a way we can do things better. Not for people angling to do business, not for people trying to, trying to uh, you know, uh, get an angle into something that's going to uh, make them money, but to make the city work. Okay. So, and I don't want to stay on this com this topic for too long, but just, just to drill down a little more, are we talking about like a citizen-led commission or are we talking about, you know, one person that's going to come in and kind of review these processes or <clears throat> what, what does that look like? I think that uh, obviously I'm going to, I'm going to oversee it mm -hmm. all, uh, but it's going to have to be, it's going to have to, th these groups that I would put together over these various areas that yep. we talked about would be people that are professionals and, but also stakeholders. I don't necessarily, you can, you can, have a point of view about permitting uh, and not be somebody who's a builder. Right. We're not giving away the farm. We're not going to have the, you know, the fox garden, the chicken house. We want people that care about the environment, that care about density, that care about all these things that would make, you know, a quality of life. But, but it would be multiple. I don't want to, the problem is you've heard these blue ribbon committees yeah, and yeah, all that of kind of these words, these bad, the, the, I don't like the connotation of those, but basically it's people that are invested, that are stakeholders, you know, not study something for 18 months and then give <laughs> some watered down report. I mean, let's figure out how we can right. make this work. Right. Okay. <clears throat> well, one of the topics that are uh, on the agenda and coming up, Metro's got a big bond issue. You just issue. wanted to talk about that, didn't you? <laughs> well, you know. You just wanted to talk about Metro. I know you did. I know all of your friends want to talk about it, too. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it is amazing how their PR machine works and how mm. they're able to uh, have us continue to fund a totally uneconomic um, mm enterprise that is a political success and a transportation failure, but mm -hmm. uh, there was that, uh, I'm, I'm unclear as to the status of the Metro Agreement. At one time, the city, I think way back to Bob Lanier, the mm -hmm. Metro had to pay half of their 1% sales tax, a one cent sales tax, yeah. to the city for the maintenance of roads and things mm -hmm. for their bus system. Mm -hmm. Is that contract still is being honored or does that it just fell by the boards you know what i couldn't even tell you i mean i, I feel like metro has has I, i've tried to follow metro and, the, and it has gotten so kind of convoluted that it is very difficult for me to follow so i i really couldn't even tell you the answer to that um i do know that you know obviously with the metro board the city the county hsd people uh these entities have appointees that that go on the board and so there is a major stake in it from city county and and, and school districts um so there is kind of a 
it, there is a concern, uh, you know, with the upcoming bond and everything about what these different entities feel should be done and as opposed to what the community feels should be done. And, I, and you know, I, I think I'm in agreement, agreement with you about uh, not necessarily, I think we, we talked about this offline, but um, about the new metro rail lines and what that means for the city and the cost of it and things like that. And so I, I would like to see, we haven't seen so much this administration take a major uh, position on metro. I'd like to see more of that. But I, I do think there is an argument there to be made that it, it kind of should be left alone in a, in a sense because they do have their own board that governs it. And it's kind of like the same thing with the mayor who's, who tried to interject himself into the HISD mess. The board of all political and, appointees. And, right, right, right. <laughs> I, it, it is, it is, it is. Um, and, you know, so it, it's an The accountability but, is kind of, uh, you know, weak there. Charlie. Oh, certainly, yeah, without it. <laughs> <No, okay. laughs> <Without it. laughs> yeah, all right. So. Yeah, no, uh, Metro is an interesting one. I think if, if I had, you know, in a perfect world, I'd like to see the Terzes contribute more to kind of transportation funding and even infrastructure funding. I don't feel like they give enough. I feel like a lot of them do, you know, kind of keep that money within their bounds and use it for crazy things. Um, I, you know, I, we can start talking about the Post Oak bus line, but I don't really want to go down that oh, that yeah, I think sure. I've, we talked about that on this show before um, but I do think there there should be a lot of reform within that area I think it's kind of run amok a little bit okay do you have any uh, plans for the terses or I what think, I think there's a doing? complete and, and you just demonstrate there's a complete <clears throat> lack of transparency I mean it even when you're talking about the general fund which is less than half of the city's budget mm -hmm. and most people don't realize that is that there's a lot of people uh, appointees and so forth who are spending more than half of the city's budget in enterprise funds, TERSes, uh, 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 management districts all over the city of Houston. And that's why you, you can go to somewhere like near Northside and Acres Homes, for instance, and see open ditches with trash everywhere, but you go to Upper Kirby and it looks like you're, you're, uh, you're in Beverly Hills, right? And, uh, and so we're going to have to get serious about, remember the whole purpose to directly answer your question, the whole purpose of a TERS was to encourage development in underdeveloped areas. Yeah, right. Right? Okay. So now we have a... I found have, out that I lived in an underdeveloped <laughs> area. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. even realize You it. didn't know Uptown was Uptown was, was, <laughs> was, was underdeveloped. Memorial City. Memorial City. You didn't know it was yeah, underdeveloped no, or Upper Kirby was... Un, or Downtown <laughs> District was underdeveloped. Yeah. But then you go to... You know, there's a... There's a, there's a a couple of there's I was looking at some of the tours revenues. It's very difficult to figure out uh, how much money they're bringing in because remember the the way it works is they they set a base level and everything above that they use that money for development in that tours defined region. Well, they just go out and leave bonds or yeah. what? The yeah, really and then they bond and then they bond, bond the money yeah. and they'll bond it so you can't try to take it back from them right, because once exactly. it's bonded when that revenue yep. stream is bonded. Then guess what? Well, we can't give you a million dollars or two million or ten million or whatever the case may be yeah, back. And, that to the and the only uh, leverage that the mayor has is when the TERS is coming up for, for renewal, if you will. Well, he appoints all the members. He, do, he does. Yeah. Good point. But what we need is, first off, we need to sunset some of these TERSs. Oh, Let's yeah. be honest. Amen. I mean, there, we need to sunset some of these TERSs because the colossal, and I know you don't want to go into it, but the colossal waste of money with that mm -hmm. post oak bus line. Mm -hmm demonstrates why the Terzes have run their course. Some of the Terzes, some of the yeah. major Terzes, yeah. Terzes that, that some of them are sitting on 40, 50, 70 million dollars. And then the Terz in some areas is 300,000. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And it's leading, in my view, it's creating pockets of great wealth in the city and pockets of incredible un, uh, areas that are underserved. Uh, and then I think some of these Terzes are, are abusing their uh, some of these management companies they put in place to go out and buy these properties and you'll have an, two or three different entities that are buying properties from folks that have lived there forever, turn around and flipping it to the management um, entity that the TERS controls and, and making 50% or more on it. Uh, and then supposedly they're going to build uh, affordable housing in these areas, but we know what it's going to be instead. It's going to be pushing people that have lived there for their whole lives out and changing the, the character of the entire uh, community in the area. So whether it be Terzas, Terzas should pay their fair share. Let's assume we don't just end all Terzas because that would create incredible uproar in this city, especially in the development I'd community. I'd be okay with it. Yeah, I would, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you're right. The mayor does appoint, not all members obviously it depends on if it was a city uh, created TERS or whether it was a state created okay. TERS but uh, the mayor does have the appointee ability the mayor has the ability to 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 not give them renewals 
because a lot of these people that want to bond some of these mo these revenue streams, it's like, well, we can't do that because you're, the TERS comes up for renewal, and so the mayor needs to give us an extension. So he has that ability to to work with them in that regard. Uh, but we're going to have to get a handle on these monies that are being spent in these TERSs and make sure it's spent more equitably across the whole city, uh, dealing with our infrastructure and our drainage issues that we have that are killing this city. And ultimately, despite, uh, and I heard what you said about the mayor stepping into the HISD, but I believe there are a lot of things a mayor of the city of Houston can do, can do to help HISD. Because if the, if the school district fails, uh, city of Houston fails, city of Houston fails, Harris County fails, and we can't allow it to happen. And then finally, the only, the only final point I will say is that we also have enterprise funds, as you know, and these dedicated funds. <clears throat> and these funds are supposed to be self-supporting, self-sustaining. But when you have a fund that, that... How many of those are there right now, Carol? Oh, I, I know the airport. airport. It's hard. It's hard. There's dedicated oh, yeah. funds and there's enterprise funds, but the biggest ones, of course, is the aviation. The aviation, aviation, right. Uh, that's the one that has, I think, it's their budget's 400 and something million. Uh, but this is, this is the fund that spent... 85 million on a building that was built for the program manager. So, you know, nowadays in big, big time construction, I built, you know, a lot of things, uh, but I never needed a program manager. I would just deal with an architect, but now we have architects, engineers, and then you have a program manager, and then the program manager reports to the city. You know, uh, it's just multiple layers of people getting paid, basically. It's like the metro uh, scam exactly. works. Exactly. You want to keep coming back to that metro thing. <laughs> But we have a we have a uh, we spent eighty five million dollars on a on a program manager office, and actually what we learned was only eleven million was actually spent on bricks and mortar, and they had wasted seventy three million dollars on a plan that even the controller says was flawed from the first instance, and when you have that kind of waste, you know there needs to be stronger oversight of the way we spend. think about it. we could have. Lay aside the Prop B and its, you know, supposed unconstitutionality, that would have paid for Prop B, $73 million. How many streets could we have, yeah. have fixed? How many drainage projects could we have done? How many police could we have hired and put on the street? Uh, there's a lot. I mean, we could have bought a lot of art for City Hall, I guess, if our priorities were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you have some art to sell. <laughs> no, not as much as I used to have. <laughs> I do want to uh, circle back to HISD. It wasn't on my list, but now that you mention it, I, I kind of want some more information on that because that has been an issue that's bothered me um, a you know, significantly, I followed HISD for a number of years, and then recently, uh, for you know, to provide a little bit of background, the mayor attempted to kind of. Well, first, when he came into office, he created a Department of Education, hired an education czar to, you know, kind of facilitate education programs and increase coordination with the districts in the area. And then he tried to, I guess it was create a nonprofit corporation to then do, take over some of the school dish, uh, school campuses to help get them out of in improvement required rating so that the district wouldn't be taken over by the state. Um, I was of the opinion, and I still am of the opinion, I, I have a kind of hard line in the sand that I don't feel that the mayor should interject himself too much into that because it is a duly elected board. But I would like to hear your position on that because this isn't something we've talked about before and it's the first time I'm hearing it. I so think we're, I think um, Houston and HISD are joined at the hip and the mayor of the city of Houston has to do everything he can to make sure HISD succeeds. And so what does that mean? Well, I look at what, what are our resources that we have? We have libraries. We have a very active uh, group uh, in the ministry all over the city who are active, that care, that are sincere, uh, that want to help. Uh, we have schools that after 315 are vacant. Mm -hmm. Okay, So we start with this proposition. From zero to two is one of the most important times in a child's life because without any stimulation in that child's life, obviously, that child is not, is not going to succeed. From, from three to five, if the child is not able to read by the time that kid starts kindergarten, He's going to, he or she is going to be two years behind. If the kid can't read by the third grade, that child is unlikely to, to, to uh, graduate high school. So these are the data points that, that everybody agrees on. So here's what I've been doing. And I was doing this long before I decided to run for mayor. Um, I believe that there's a lot of old money in this city. A lot of people, generational wealth, whether it be the Cullens, the Kinders, uh, people that, that are, you know, Margaret Alcock Williams. These are all people that are friends of mine. Um, who have a mindset of let's try to transformationally change the city of Houston. How do we do it? It starts with education. It starts with education. 
you know, when Amazon looks at Houston and, and says, you know, obviously the flooding issue and obviously um, uh, HISD probably, probably scared them off despite the huge incentives that the city of Houston offered them. When technology companies are thinking about, I want to do real 5G, which actually exists, that's not dangerous like people say. I've met with some of these, these uh, guys that are in that industry that are doing a pilot project in Singapore right now where you can download your favorite movie. Mine is, uh, yours may have something to do with Metro. Mine, <laughs> my, my favorite movie is No Country. You can download it within a second. No Country for Old Men. For Old Men. That's no, mine's no. favorite. Fellas for good Yeah, that's a good one. Um, but so, you know, it's, the, the future of his, Houston, we have to have a, a workforce that's educated and not just necessarily, you know, a lot of folks going to college, but also vocational training. So one of the things, we have this program that we've been working on for a while called Moonshot. And think about it. We were the first city that, that did a um, heart transplant. We helped put somebody on the moon. We dredged, uh, you know, to, to Galveston's chagrin, we dredged the Houston Ship Channel and bypassed Galveston and made Houston one of the, the great ports of the country. We can do this. We can go to the third ward. We can get some of this private money. You got, you got people that are sitting on $400 million in these, in these trusts uh, and these foundations that have to kick off 5% every year. Mm -hmm. So it's just, a, where are they going to put it? What are they going to do? Are they going to build another building and put their name on it? Are they going to renovate Bi Buffalo Bayou Park for the third time after it gets flooded, <laughs> right? Uh, think about the, the transformational change we can make with that kind of money. $200 million in a defined area. We're going to do a moonshot here. We're going to make sure there's prenatal care. We're going to make sure that there's one of the big problems with children and, and doing well in school is, is truancy because they don't have a stable place to, to live because there's, a, there's not affordable housing. We're going to deal with these issues with regard to zero to two about the stimulation a kid needs, teaching the child to read, make sure they can read before they start school, make sure there's after school programs about financial literacy, make sure that you have you have uh, issues with regard to recidivism for folks that are trying to do the right thing but have been drug, drug, drug back into uh, uh, and with people that they shouldn't be associating with. Uh, that can be done. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna do a pilot, regardless of what happens in this mayor race, we're gonna do a pilot project. We're gonna do it in the third ward because we have <clears throat> University of Houston there and TSU there, great resources that we can use. Uh, Neil Bush is excited about it. The Cullen Foundation's excited about it. I'm trying to get other foundations excited about it so we can really not just go in there and throw a lot of money and you know go in there and say, we're gonna fix this. That's not my point. We're gonna partner with folks that, that have been working on these issues for a long, long time. But ultimately, that's gonna make HISD succeed. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need is somebody with a, the architecture and a comprehensive plan to say, this is what we're gonna do, folks. Now get on board and let's go do it. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time with a lot of pastors there that are, you know, these are things that they're really excited about being involved with uh, that have been, you know, too many times I blink, I think, whether it be the homeless issue, whether it be stray animal population, whether it be um, sexual trafficking, human trafficking. We got all these people working so hard trying to do the right thing, but they're working in silos. And there's nobody providing them an overarching. Here's our comprehensive plan on this issue. Here's the metrics that we're going to we're going to decide whether we're being successful and how we can change it. And that's how I've done my business. That's how I've run run my business. That's how I do a lawsuit. Um, but I think that a mayor can have an incredible amount of influence uh, over HISD, and I intend to have that. So we're talking about support systems that rather than what I envisioned from what the mayor said and, and from you know initial conversations was a more consolidation or attempt to consolidate yeah. power. So we're talking about support systems. Talking about I'm okay. talking about, you know, education is, is you know, from birth to grave. Yeah. And yeah. I think sometimes we, we forget that. And um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot of things that a lot of people are very motivated to do uh, to make the city of Houston better. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk about Metro and, you know, building more trains, you know, to various places that probably will never be ridden on. Uh, but let's try to remember that what the, the wave of the future is not a bunch of more trains or buses. The wave of the future is driverless cars, you know. For sure. Uh, I mean, we need to start thinking about that. Um, and you, you, you never hear a mayor or a mayor or candidate talk about, like, where do we want to be in 10 years? Where do we want to be in 25 years? What do we want to be known for? What do we what do we want to be proud of? You know, we kind of just kind of just react, react, react and, and, you know, take it as it comes. And I think I think that um, a, a city like this with this can do atmosphere, very diverse, very dynamic. Uh, I, I, 
I'm really excited. I think I think there's a we have a long way to go, but I'm excited about where we're going going to go. Yeah, well, what I will say is that I I specifically on the recidivism aspect, I think that's a huge thing. I you know, I I do a lot of work with with guys who are still incarcerated on their way out and kind of are, you know, building business plans and doing things like that. And I think that the city can offer a space there for people like that. I mean, I know there are different things like the new uh, Texas RX Labs maker space that are offering things like that for them, but I think that, you know, that could be a great opportunity for people like that who who want to uh, take advantage of those opportunities that the city offers and they might not know about them or might not be educated about them. So I do think that that is incredible important. Um, and, and then to kind of transition from that point, um, how about we talk about, a little bit about policing and, and crime? You touched upon it before um, and wanting to kind of shift that philosophy from, uh, I guess, responding to more anticipating and anticipatory policing, mm -hmm. community policing. Yeah, and, um, I, and, I've, and I've called it anticipatory policing, and that's my word. I mean, I, I'm basically just stealing what Bratton did mm -hmm. in New York City. Yeah. Uh, I just saw an article that the actual uh, the individual who uh, who actually wrote the original uh, broken window uh, policing policy just died, mm. but it it transformationally changed the way policing is done. And basically, what it is 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 using data and sharing data, real time data, to anticipate crimes where they're going to occur and stop them before they occur. And it sounds pretty simple, but when you're talking about boots on the ground, how it works, it requires you know a lot of times police. Police departments, you know, they can't even talk to each other. They can't, or, or different police organizations mm -hmm. can't talk to each other. They have to, you know, you would think they would just be able to talk to each other via cell phone or something because, right. you know, I can text you or call you. And, well, did you give me your number? <laughs> no, um, but there's a book, a very well-known book uh, called CompStat. Mm -hmm. And basically it's, it's all about data mining. Uh, it's all about real-time data. We have we have a crime statistics organization within the police department, but most people will, if they're honest with you, will tell you they don't really do any statistics mm -hmm. about, <clears throat> or certainly no statistics about how do we prevent crime. Mm -hmm. It's more about let's report what we're doing here. Um, if, Sounds like a Tom Cruise movie I yeah. saw a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, um, but 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 it's it's a whole <clears throat> different way of policing that's been proven to work in various cities. <clears throat> that dramatically decreases crime mm -hmm. dramatically. Like it's not, I'm not talking about 10 percent. I'm talking about 40 percent. And um, and it also is a no a no tolerance on even the smallest crimes. But what, what data and studies will show you that people that will commit small crimes are typically the people that will commit larger crimes. Mm -hmm. You know. And um, but there's been books written on mm -hmm. it. The, the the main book is CompStat. And what we're going to have to do when I'm the mayor is make sure that we have a police chief who buys into it. It's going to be a it's going to be a a, a different way of policing. Uh, we're going to have to, of course, you know, it's easy to say we're going to put more police on the streets, but we are. Mm -hmm. um, typically, a police department, 60 percent of the, the police officers are on the streets. We're upside down. We only have 40 percent of ours. So we're going to have to get more people out from behind desks and out of offices and back on the street. Because anybody that's driven down Memorial, as an example, when you, see, you go by the police memorial and you see that police car out there, you slow down. Right? That's called deterrence. Right? So when there's a police presence in your community, uh, it, it does, in fact, decrease crime. And obviously the, 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 the follow-on to that is a police presence where the police are actually interacting with, with the residents, where the residents don't feel threatened by the police officer but feel like he's an asset or she's an asset. Uh, but all that, you know, part of it includes, and it's all on my website, but part of it includes uh, encouraging, incentivizing officers to live in the areas in which they patrol, to make sure the officers look like uh, the folks that live in the areas which, in which they patrol, to make sure they realize that, that a major part of it is not just to close cases or to make arrests, but is to develop relationships. Uh, all of that's part of the CompStat uh, process, and um, it's been proven uh, like I say, uh, to make a dramatic, dramatic change in in uh, crime. Okay, we've got a few, uh, just about three minutes left. I wonder, uh, should we talk about the budget uh, issues coming up? Is the budget a done deal, Charles, and from your uh, observation to City Hall and where? Uh, 
Where is the? Is it? Is it balanced or what? <laughs> no, not not. I don't know when the last time we depends had a balance. Depends on how you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they, and who they, you ask. They play, yeah, right. play games with the budget. Um, so yeah, so where we're at right now is we're kind of right in the middle. Uh, well, actually, we're nearing the end of budget workshop. So got some more next week. May twenty eighth, I believe, is the last day council members have to submit budget amendments. June fifth will be the day that they vote on the budget. So we still have some more to hear from. We have fire to hear from. We heard from police today. I think today. you ought to tell us, uh, viewers, just a little anecdote about your. Uh, your exchange with the police yeah. department today. <laughs> yeah. Just for the heck of yeah, so today we, the, the police department presented their budget to city council and uh, interestingly there's a guy by the name of Doug Smith who has been there every day questioning different aspects of the budget, different departments, and one of the things he asked about was within the police department budget they talked about their fiscal, two, fiscal year 2019 um, vehicles that they auctioned off. So this is through seizures, this is through tows where no one picked it up and things like that. And so they auctioned off 27,000 vehicles and when he asked how much revenue came in from that, they said $800,000. So, I mean, when you break it down, it's about $29, 29 and some change per vehicle, which sounds absolutely absurd. So, you know, I, I, I kind of tweeted at the police chief with the clip of the video of him acknowledging this. And so he responded, um, didn't seem too happy with, with, with the inquiry, saying that um, there's all these other things that go into it and there's state law that governs it and they have to give cuts here and cuts there. But we still haven't seen a thorough breakdown. So my frustration is that you know, we're in the mid middle of budget workshops and you're telling me that there's this major line item and I'm incorrect in saying that $29 is what it breaks down to. But if we're in the middle of budget workshops, why are you not breaking that down for the public to know? So it is frustrating. And, and to your point, I, the budget is not a done deal. I think we're, interestingly, we had a discuss not we, they had a discussion uh, the other day where it came about that they don't necessarily have to pass the budget. They're required to vote on the budget. And the legal department and the finance department and the controller's office were dancing around whether or not they had to pass it. The legal department said they had to pass it. The finance department said they had to vote on it. And then the controller's office said there have been instances where they haven't passed the budget and have operated from kind of a continuing resolution, which is you base your spending on previous year's budgets. So um, there's a little conversation about that. I don't know that council members are going to, yeah, I wish we had a council member, council body that was strong enough to vote again, vote it down and make the mayor come back with a more transparent and, and you know, constrained budget. But I don't see that happening. But um, yeah, it's it's not balanced. I think it's, you know, we're about three and a quarter percent over last year. They're spending more. Um, there was supposed to be a hiring freeze. They hired more more uh, employees throughout this past year. I don't, I'm frustrated with the budget. I, I took up a lot of time. You're the guest yeah, of honor. So why don't you tell us? <laughs> well, we only have a little bit of time okay. left. Do you want to well, I'm, I'm just I'm, some comments just in general. Yeah, I'm just I just would say that, that I'm, just, I'm uh, proud of some of these council members <clears throat> for the first time, and they may disagree with me, but I think for the first time they're actually aggressively questioning this mm -hmm. mayor, and I think that's what we've needed. And because when he's aggressively questioned, he doesn't have really good responses, right. just like the response the police chief gave you. Um, but we're up against it. You know, we 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 I believe that uh, we are at a crossroads. Whether are we going to be the city we're really scared we may become? Are we going to be the city we could be? Okay. Well, that's a very upbeat remarks to end it on. I want to thank. <clears throat> both our hosts here at HMS-TV and our wonderful producer, Mark Pirtle, uh, for allowing us to come on and uh, share this information with the rest of the city. And Tony, for you, uh, appreciate you coming on and, and uh, subject yourself to the uh, what <laughs> Good to be with you drilling guys. or whatever. And I'll, Charles, I'll, I'll go home and think about Metro. Uh, <laughs> I know you. <laughs> and I hope all our viewers will uh, have enjoyed the show and will uh, tune in uh, on future episodes of Public Affairs, Public Access, where we'll have some other interesting folks as well. So thank both of you and appreciate you having here. Today. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a great time.